But of all the senses that we possess, vision is undoubtedly our most developed. Dogs might have great noses, owls might have great ears, but humans, we have great eyes. Here we can see an image of the outer layer of our brains called the cortex. Forgetting all the stuff inside, this is a highly interconnected outer shell. This whole piece here is called the parietal cortex, and it's critical for mapping out our entire body's sensations and movements. This part here, the temporal lobe, is critical for things like hearing, language, memory, and it has many other functions. But this entire region in the back here, the occipital lobe, covers just one thing, and that's our vision. In this video, I'm going to detail out the anatomy of our visual systems, uh, all the way from the retinas in our eyes to the back of the cortex that we just saw. How we can go from detecting simple flashes of light to complex objects and facial recognition. And to highlight the function of each piece along the way, I'm going to also cover what happens to our visual system when it's damaged in different ways, resulting in bizarre and interesting visual disorders. Everything starts with the retina, a bit of basic anatomy primer. Light enters through the cornea, hits the back of our eyes in a layer of photosensitive cells called the retina. The nerve fibers that stem from these cells bundle together to form the optic nerve, and they exit through the back of the eye in something called the optic disc. What happens next is that both nerve bundles from each eye cross each other and form what's called the optic chiasm, meaning intersection. This crossing is important because it means that from now on, about 60% of the information coming from the left eye goes to the right side of the brain and vice versa. After this, it's then referred to as the optic tract, and it carries information from both left and right eyes. The majority of these fibers go to a midbrain structure called the dorsal lateral geniculate nucleus. Dorsal means on top, lateral means to the side, and geniculate means sharp angle, so called because of where it's placed and what it's shaped like. This is one small component of a much larger and incredibly complex part of the brain called the thalamus that takes sensory information and organizes it to be sent to the rest of the brain. The most common analogy that's used is that it's kind of like the brain's air traffic controller or switchboard operator. What the geniculate nucleus does is a little bit difficult to explain. It's organized into several different cell layers. Each layer receives input from the eyes in a kind of semi-organized way and it reorganizes these signals uh, and sends them out to the cortex. Ultimately, what this means is that the signals that come from the eye aren't just simplistic representations of the world, but layered left and right, up and down, and from both eyes, in such a way that what leaves the geniculate nucleus is a useful pattern set of visual data that can allow for coordinated eye movements, spatial and temporal correlations, and guided directed vision. From the thalamus, Nerve fibers then radiate out to the brain's outer layer, the cortex, in something quite predictably called the optic radiation. Altogether, this makes up what's called the retinogeniculostriate pathway, because no one said neuroanatomy was supposed to be easy. The structure of the cortex is a thin layer of cells about two millimeters thick that covers the outer surface of most of our brains. That's all these folds that you can see here. It has six distinct cell layers and a number of complex connections both between and across these layers, but also between different segments of the entire cortex. The neurons from the lateral geniculate nucleus project onto what's called the striate cortex, striate meaning striped. The type of information that is sent starts off simple, representing things like lines or color gradients, but as we move up the visual cortex, the information begins to take on more detailed forms, eventually moving on to other areas like the temporal parietal and frontal lobes to inform our movements, memories, and thoughts. Primary visual cortex is called V1. From there we see V2, where cells are tuned to simple properties like orientation, spatial frequency, and color, and then to V3 around over here, important for motion detection. V4, seen over here, uh, is often found to be important for color representation, and V5, sometimes called the middle, the middle temporal visual area, important for motion detection. These areas are all organized by general function, but of course there's anatomical names associated with the various bumps and curves that make them up as well. The direction and order of visual information is roughly divided up into two identifiable streams. 
There's a ventral stream that leads to the inferior part of the temporal lobe for object recognition, and there's a dorsal stream that leads to the parietal lobes uh, and is spatial in nature for things like movement, orientation, and the position of objects. There are different cortical regions beyond the anatomy of the occipital lobe, of course, uh, that make use of visual information. And here's a chart of some of them, each with a defined anatomical place in the cortex and with a distinct function. There's also a few smaller pathways in the visual system that are worth mentioning. A select type of nerve fibers from the eye uh, do not follow this main pathway at all, but instead go to the superior colliculus, where it guides coordination of head and eye movements to guide our eyes to visual targets in our visual field. It's a little hard to visualize, uh, but it's in the midbrain, and we can see it here labeled in green in this section of the brain. A few neurons project to the pretectum, uh, another midbrain area involved in reflex control of the pupil and the lens. And finally, another set of nerve fibers deviate from this larger path and go directly to the hypothalamus, uh, which we see here in blue, to direct our sleep-wake cycle, which we'll get into a little bit later. Now it's one thing to uh, just memorize a bunch of neuroanatomy and a bunch of uh, circuits, something else to understand how it works. So to do this, I'm going to cover what happens when we damage uh, each step along this visual pathway. So let's go through and see what happens to our vision. First things first, the retina. If we damage this completely well, well we don't see anything at all because no information gets to our brains. However, there are different types or degrees of damage that can exist. Things like macular degeneration or a macular edema, retinal tears, a scotoma, a cataracts, and color blindness. Most people tend to be unaware when they have scotomas, these big chunks missing from their visual field, much like people are unaware of their blind spots. And this is because our eyes move around so fast and we can usually pick up all the useful information that we need in our visual fields without ever really being conscious or noticing it. Uh, and the only way you really ever notice your blind spot or a scotoma is through a clever test where you block certain parts of your visual field. Changes to the structure of other parts of the eye can of course result in nearsightedness or farsightedness. Severing the optic nerve will completely eliminate any visual information sent to the brain from the eye that you sever it from. But severing the optic tract, which occurs after the chiasm or the, the crossing, the splitting, will result in something slightly different. The way that the optic nerves are organized, uh, you can kind of imagine this, that the light comes from the right side of us, and when it comes from the right of us, it hits the left side of both of our eyes. This information that gets sent to the left side of the brain, and vice versa. What this means is that if you were to sever the left optic track, you would lose all the visual information from the right half of your visual field. Of course, you could sever at various parts of the optic chiasm and produce different effects. If we cut this way, our vision would look like this, and if we cut this way, our vision might look something like this. Damage to the lateral geniculate nucleus results in similar types of visual defects, basically just chunks of our visual field missing scotomas. But after the uh, lateral geniculate nucleus, the nerve fibers representing visual information also split between the upper and lower visual fields, as not just left and right. This means that the projections of the optic radiation that move higher up represent the lower part of the visual field, just how like things from the left represent things from the right. So if we were to cut, let's say, for example, somewhere over here, we might see something like this. Now we talked about a set of fibers that go to the hypothalamus. Now there's a, a place in the hypothalamus that this visual information goes to, and it's called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And it can kind of be thought of as our body's internal clock. Light activates certain cells in the retina that project to the SCN, which we'll call it for short. Uh, and when they do, they activate a number of rhythmically timed biological processes, such as hormone release and specific types of neural circuits. Damage to the SCN can occur uh, when you have a stroke or maybe a tumor. And what happens is that the daily rhythms of your body won't really work as they should anymore. And this results in poor sleep, uncontrollable hormone functions, and metabolic problems. Being in control of the eye's reflexive movements, the pretectum and the superior colliculus, like we mentioned, are important for smooth eye movements when following objects. Uh, the pupillary light reflex 
and maintaining focus. Damage would mean that you would be unable to adjust your pupils when light changes uh, or smoothly follow objects as well as having blurred vision. Once we move up to the cortex, this is where things start to get really interesting. Each of the defined areas has their own function relevant to vision, uh, although very rarely is brain damage ever you know, limited across these, uh, these clean cut lines. Areas V1 and V2 are uh, very important for just general, general purpose, multi-purpose kind of light, color, and motion, and so oftentimes produce impairments of complete blindness or something called uh, cortical scotomas or cortical blindness. Perfect example would be uh, case study BK. This was a patient who was left hemi-anopic in his visual field. Hemi meaning half and anopic meaning blind. A stroke in area V1 in the right occipital lobe left a large chunk of his visual field missing, making him cortically blind. Area V4 is responsible for color information and damage results in something called cerebral achromatopsia. After a concussion, clinical case study JI became colorblind. Everything about his world became shades of dirty gray. And although it was never determined where the damage actually happened, it would presumably be related to area V4. In the opposite direction, in the case of patient PB, severe electrocution uh, gave him posterior cortical damage, and he was left completely blind, only being able to tell whether there was a strong light being present or not. One visual function that was spared was uh, PB's ability to determine color with this light. He was able to perceive color but not the form of objects, so, and so speculated that his vision would have looked something, some, something kind of like this. Many brain lesions will damage one area while leaving others intact. Because of the fact that the lateral geniculate nucleus through the optic radiation doesn't just send signals just to V1, but disperses, radiates, uh, throughout much of the occipital lobe, Several functions of vision can still be present while others are missing. Patient DF, for example, was blind. She could not see objects or tell you what they were, uh, and for all intents and purposes had nothing in front of her visual field. But when asked to reach out and grab objects, she would go directly to the object and shape her hand in the appropriate way given whatever the object happened to be. This is because she had a severe lesion in the lateral occipital cortex, remember the ventral stream for object recognition, uh, but had an intact dorsal stream and so could still uh, move towards objects and where they were. Another patient, DB, had his right calcarine fissure removed, uh, and that's this large crease that you can see here. He was left hemianopic, much like patient BK, but when asked if he could see uh, what was presented in front of him, he always reported that he could not, so he's, he's basically blind. However, when asked whether something was in his visual field or not, even though he's blind, he could point to it, and if the object was moving, he could follow along and tell you what direction that it was going in, an example of something called blind sight. Patient LM received vascular damage to area V5, important for motion detection, and so lost all ability to track the motions of objects. Uh, things would only exist in either one static state or another. While we might see something like this, LM would see something like this. Visual agnosia is a term used to describe the inability to combine individual elements into a cohesive whole, resulting in the inability to recognize or name objects uh, or draw them. In the case of DF, carbon monoxide poisoning left her with a series of interesting visual deficits. She could see normally and move about the world with good vision, uh, and she could recognize objects that were presented to her, but not images of those objects. She could draw objects from memory but not real ones that were in front of her. Damage to the posterior parietal lobe produces something called optic ataxia. Taxis means motion or orientation, and so ataxia is the inability to control body movements. In patient BK, bilateral hemorrhages resulted in damage to her occipital lobe. She could uh, easily both see form and color, she could recognize and name objects, yet she could not reach out and grab them, kind of the opposite of what we had uh, described before, the patient who couldn't see anything but could successfully reach out and grab objects. Uh, most people are unaware of how they grab things because it's such an automatic behavior, uh, but how we grab things is almost completely dependent on seeing what we're grabbing. Without the ability to use visual information to guide body movements, grabbing things becomes basically impossible. 
one thing that we're capable of doing as people is abstracting out larger concepts from individual objects. For example, this is a tree, but this is a forest. However, one such visual disorder called simultagnosia associated with damage to the ventral stream, patients can perceive only one object at a time. So keeping track of multiple objects or recognizing them as belonging to a whole becomes functionally impossible. And finally, some visual impairments of higher level processing. One disorder called prosopagnosia is the inability to recognize faces. One region in particular, the fusiform face area, is critical in this regard. Everyone becomes basically a stranger. Some patients even have difficulty recognizing their own faces in the mirror. Outlining the functional neuroanatomy of the flow of visual information across our brains, along with the neuropsychological testing of these various case studies, teaches us a few interesting things about vision and what we do with it. There isn't just one simple unified seeing and that's it. There are multiple complex visual processes that all come together. There is a vision for action, like grasping. There's action for vision, like purposefully directing your eye movements. Uh, there's visual recognition involving memory, and there's also visual space, making sense of where we are in reference to the world around us. All of these different components come together to guide all sorts of behaviors like memory, navigation, and cognition. Thank you for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. Please like, share, and subscribe, and as always, have a great day.